the governing board of the Universidad Pontificia Comillas, following the proposal of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, and in acknowledgement of your relevant merits, have named you Dr. Honoris Causa by virtue of the powers vested in me, I hereby confer this doctorate degree and award you said diploma. Receive the Book of Wisdom and of God's Love. Persevere it a symbol of all that you have to learn and to teach, and as the testimony that as great as your wisdom may be, it has to be always nurtured with the meditation of God's Word, the example of the ancient masters and the conquest of the new so that they may serve as the basis for your own discoveries, foundation for your teachings, and a stimulus to perpetuate them in your disciples. <laughs> Mr. John, El Esposito, I hereby admit and incorporate you to the Faculty of Doctors of the Universidad Pontificia Comillas with the same rights and obligations as the other doctors at the, this university. Receive these white gloves as a symbol of the fortitude that your hands must preserve, and also as a sign of the dignity of your high rank. I hereby accept this doctor degree conferred upon me and promise to dedicate my efforts I'm an emotional Italian. Uh, to the service of the truth and communion with those of you here who teach and learn in the name of the church. Thank you. As you have joined this university, receiving the name of the faculty, this fraternal embrace from all those who feel honored and pleased to be your colleagues. You. Receive this cap as a sign of your dignity and symbol of the teaching profession to which you have been called so that your wisdom may be of use of many. The first thing you will see is that I have a big head, so I may lose the hat. <laughs> In more ways than one, I have a big head. Um, Richter Martinez, Father Emilia, faculty and students, I want to tell you what a great honor it is to receive this honorary doctorate from your university. I am one of three boys in the family. And I often say to people, and this is confirmed by my family, that I'm the least intelligent. My graduate record exams, I think I've forgotten. All I remember is if you add the two scores together, it looked like one good score. My mother was asked once when she saw me on stage, what do you think when you see John? She said, thank God he's got a job. 
<laughs> and then they said, um, did he read a lot as a child? She said, well, every day in the summertime, my children had to read. She said, but with John, I always had to find books that had a lot of pictures. <laughs> so now you will have a sense, I say that, because you've just heard the real Coke, and now you will hear Coke light. <laughs> Trying to understand Islam and Muslims today can seem almost hopeless. Muslim leaders speak of Islam as a religion of peace. Bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS terrorists slaughter Muslims and non-Muslims globally in the name of Islam. President George W. Bush, when president, referred to Islam as a religion of peace. In contrast, President Trump has said, Islam hates us. I think he thinks Islam is a man or a woman, I'm not sure. Islam hates us. When asked for some distinction on that, he just said, lots of them. They hate us. Okay. He advocates a Muslim ban. He's uh, talked about monitoring mosques, etc. Globalization and immigration are producing more multi-faith and multi-ethnic societies, transforming countries in the West. One only needs to think about, uh, at least for me, the contrast coming from America, which really is a country from its very beginning of great diversity, and when I would first come to Europe, Northern Europe and other places where I noticed everybody was white, everybody spoke the same language, you know, you know roughly speaking. Today, that's changing tremendously. The world was described in my time in the 60s and 70s, certainly the US and Europe, in terms of religion, as being Protestant, Catholic, and then more recently, Jewish. There was a famous book done by a sociologist of religion on that topic. Today, the religious landscape of many countries in the West include Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Sikhs. I was raised in cosmopolitan New York. There was no mosque. At my time, there were two mosques maybe in the United States. One was the Mosque of Boston, which wasn't in Boston. It was in Quincy. And the other was in Idaho or Iowa, still an area that's inconceivable to me, although I visited, and why Muslims all the way back then went to that part of the place to live. Today, we have 2.3 billion Christians. Muslims are 1.6 to 1. 0.7 billion. Under the previous pope, uh, the Vatican said that indeed there were now more uh, Muslims than there were Catholics. One of the few things he did that I could agree with. Um, by 2050, Islam is projected to be equal in terms of Christians to Christians in the number of his followers. In many countries in the West, Islam and Muslims have emerged as the second or third largest religion. Some accept that as a great sign of diversity, and for others, it's a cause for fear and concern. If you want a sense of a good deal of what I'll talk about, um, I just suggest that you go to bridge.georgetown.edu, bridge.georgetown.edu. You'll see a lot of the data that will back up some of my comments that uh, we have on that site. Today, the very realities of globalization also include the emergence of the far right, white, far right white nationalist political leaders and parties in Europe, and as we saw in the last election, in America. Many of them are anti-immigrant and have anti-Muslim agendas. We've seen the exponential growth of Islamophobia. For all these reasons, from my point of view, interfaith and interreligious understanding is crucial. It's crucial for the next generation. In many ways, I would say it has everything to do about religion. It has nothing to do with religion. It has everything to do for those who are not necessarily religious with just understanding those diverse structures and peoples that are going to more and more be in our societies. One of the great ironies of our time is that despite the global presence of Islam and Muslims as a major religious faith and a global political presence, it took the Iranian revolution to put Islam on the map. Islam was invisible in terms of policymakers. When I got into the field in the 60s and 70s, the American Academy of Religion, which sees itself as the academy looking at religion, had no coverage of Islam. We had to demonstrate that there could be over a four-year period. The Middle East Studies Association had no panels 
I had the honor in both cases of being elected to both of them as president. In my time, I would have never been, that would have never been the case, nor for many of my colleagues. It was just invisible. People would just look at us. When I said I was going to do Islam, they said, you'll never, you'll never have a job. Why would you do that? You know, stay in theology. There'll always be Catholic universities with theology departments. And that was very much the reality. When I finished my degree, there were virtually no jobs in America in terms of Islam. Fortunately, I could teach four religions because I was trained in them. But if that had not been the case, I would have been unemployed. My own encounter with Islam and my career were profoundly affected by the Iranian Revolution. The Iranian Revolution put for diplomats the notion that the Middle East was on the map of strategic significance. Okay? The Iranian Revolution, as I put it, when I finished my degree, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to take the hat off because it's going to fly right off my head. <laughs> Um, when I created my center, I always say that the door leading into my office had to be widened twice the size just to get my head through it. <laughs> and people that know me know why. Okay. Um, I often say that the Iranian Revolution gave me my career because for the first six years, nobody was calling me to speak. Nobody was interested in, in what I was doing. Uh, when I went to Holy Cross, they wanted me to teach world religions and all the religions, there was no mention about Islam. I, I waited till the Iranian Revolution to that period to teach about Islam. I owe my career and my first Lexus to the Ayatollah Khomeini. I did receive an award years later from Iran, and it turned out for the first encyclopedia that I did that it was 32 pieces of gold with Ayatollah Khomeini's face on them. More recently, my wife and I took it in after all these years to see if it was real gold. Turned out it's like 24 carat. But the woman in the jewelry shop said, I can make a bracelet for your watch, and for your wife. I thought, yeah, with Khomeini. <laughs> you know, or a necklace. I said, no, 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 we're not interested in that. So why and how did I get here today? It's difficult to today to appreciate how much the religious landscape has indeed changed. In less than 40 years, Islam, Muslims, and Muslim politics have gone from nowhere to everywhere. I was raised in Brooklyn, New York, in an Italian neighborhood. And for as far as I could walk as a young kid, everybody was Italian and Catholic. Some were mafia. We don't want to talk about that. I went back to my family village and discovered some are mafia. But anyway, OK. At the age of 14, in 1954, I left home for 10 years to become a Capuchin Franciscan priest and left at the age of 24. I earned an MA in Catholic theology at the time of Vatican II, and that was my early glory days. I was a Catholic theologian, a lay Catholic theologian. I saw the church changing, and that's where I thought my career would be. I went to Temple University to get a PhD in Catholic studies and wound up never taking a course in Catholic studies because they required a course in world religions. I decided to do Hinduism and Buddhism Eventually, the chair said to me, we just hired a Muslim, you should study with him. I thanked him twice, and he said, no, I'm not only suggesting, I expect you to, and I realized that I was already a little old at getting a doctorate, I was about 30 years old, and that I ought to take the course. I took the course, the Muslim scholar said, we need to sit down and talk about your Arabic and the other courses you'll take. I said, but I said I'm only taking one course. A year and a half later, I was suddenly majoring in a topic that I look back now at, at my age and wonder, why did I do that? People often say that I'm street smart. They mean that both as a compliment, but also for some, they mean it as something else. But for me to understand why I, who am quite street smart and reality-based in terms of careers, why I finished a degree in Islam. I just have, I mean, other than the fact that it, it just stunned me to see that there was a Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition historically and theologically. Rather than in my time when I was studying, Islam was put with Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism. Judaism and Christianity was put on the other side. What really grabbed me, and, and what, what are the things that I try to tell people about, and what, what has really been the, the underpinning of a good deal of, of my career? While there are specific differences, that exist, Muslims and Christians share many common beliefs. Belief in God, monotheism, that God is the creator, sustainer, and judge of the world. God is compassionate and merciful. 
when a Muslim prays, when a Muslim begins a speech if they're conservative, when they drive their car, when they have a meal, they will say Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of God, the merciful and compassionate. They also share a belief in, in the prophets, revelation, angels, moral accountability. As Christians see the New Testament succeeding the Hebrew Bible or what we call the Old Testament, for Muslims, the Quran succeeds the revelation to Moses and Jesus. Muslims do not deny that revelation, at least not mainstream Muslims, but they see the Quran as bringing that completion. Jesus and Mary play a central role in Islam. The name Jesus occurs in the Quran more than the name Muhammad. Mary is mentioned more in the Quran than Mary is mentioned in the New Testament. Common Muslim names are Isa, Jesus, and Musa. One of my Muslim friends who's a leader has two sons with those names. And what he said after 9-11 was, you know, I said, it must be a difficult time for you. He said, yes. He said, I, I, I go on television shows and people, you know, uh, 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 say all kinds of things about the Quran and all kinds of things about the Prophet Muhammad. And then he smiled and said, but I can't say anything back to them about Jesus or about Moses. You know, they're Christians and Jews. They're attacking my religion. I can't quite do that. You know, I mean, other than if you were talking about an extremist. For your average uh, uh, person that I still run into today, all of this is unknown. Both Islam and Christianity believe that God has given the earth as a trust to humankind and see themselves as God's representatives on earth who are to promote a just society. If you read the Quran, one of the things that's amazing about it is how often social justice occurs, how often human responsibility occurs. How then did we wind up where we are today? To begin with, the real problem was that for many, the first engagement with Islam was the Iranian Revolution and people shouting death to America. If you know nothing about a religion and you put your TV on and you see these people saying this over and over again, your idea is A, that everybody in Iran feels that way, and B, this must be what Muslims are like. And of course, when you hear Al-Qaeda and, and ISIS in their statements, the same thing happens. But I compare it also to the, the issue of ethnicity. If you don't know another ethnic group, the danger is you will generalize on the first few that you meet. In my family, when I was young, a mixed marriage was to marry somebody who wasn't Italian. And so for my grandmother, when she saw my Aunt Kitty, who was Irish, married to my Uncle George, and they both drank, she'd point and say, see what they're like? Meaning my Aunt Kitty. She never pointed at Uncle George. That's what they're like. That's what the Irish are like. When I first dated my wife, I brought her home to meet my parents. Father Amelia can't tell these kinds of stories. Uh, when I first went, I, I brought her home to meet my parents. My wife is a, a blonde, blue eyes, brilliant, but also very attractive. And she came out looking like an Italian woman in mourning, black, hair pulled back, no makeup. And I said after her, why did you dress this way? She said, well, I, did you have a good time? She said, yeah, your parents are really warm. I said, well, why? Is so my next door neighbors are Italian. And they scream, you know, they, they argue a lot, and they fight. And so there was that generalization. For Americans and for people in Europe, to see the Iranian revolution and to hear Khomeini call for the spread of that revolution. And you'll remember right after it, you had uprisings in the Gulf that looked like there was a momentum. You even had problems in, in, in South America in terms of Hezbollah. Fear of the export of what some call the green menace put Islam in the Middle East on the front burner for Americans, Europeans, and international politics. It created a market for experts on Islam. You couldn't get enough I couldn't publish for the first decade. After that, 10 books, 20, 30, 40, just there. You produce a good book, publish it. There's a market for it. And yet when I had my career, the whole idea was to have a degree in theology was nice if you were going to be a priest, but, you know, and certainly you weren't going to move up the ladder in any way. So that primary lens in which Islam and Muslims were seen was that of a threat caused by multiple upheavals, not just the Iranian revolution, the assassination of Amwar Sadat, Saddam Hussein in the first Gulf War, and his calling it a jihad. Overlooked was the nature of mainstream Islam. 
That was compounded by 9-11, 7-7, the attacks in, in Madrid, and continues to be the media focus on that. I'm going to try to keep this short, hopefully. We'll need God's help on this. Uh, so I'm introducing something that I didn't plan to talk about, but I want to give you a concrete example. It's the biggest example as far as I'm concerned. Media sets the message, number one, and it's social media, okay, and mass media. Now watch this. An outfit called Media Tenor, you can go on T-E-N-O-R, you can go on the, on the internet and find this. They study massively European and American media. So they did a study from 2001 to 2011. In 2001, they were looking at all this media, 975,000 pieces of media. Where is Islam? How's the coverage? 2% on extremism, 0.1% on mainstream Islam, the broader context. 2011, 2% goes to 25%. This side goes to, stays at 0.1%. Incredible disparity. 2015, they do a study of Western media, European and America, and discover that in the US, UK, and the United States, for example, eight out of 10, sometimes nine out of 10 stories that deal with Islam and Muslims are simply on extremism and terrorism. And it's not that we shouldn't be concerned and cover that in our media, but we also have to put that within the context of the broader context. Think about the coverage of ISIS. I ask audiences often how many people they think are in ISIS. This, this power that we really fear. Okay. Most experts will say, generally, never more than 30,000. They're very effective, but you know, we're not talking about the United States military, you know, the Russian military, you know, which is some of the leaders today remain, we'll be seeing a lot uh, in our, on our TV screens. Now, historically, both Christians and Muslims have their bitter memories of conquest and religious intolerance. However, our memories of the past, can, how, however our memories of the past, continued experience of interreligious conflicts globally, the emergence of Islam as the second, third, uh, and largest religion, make it imperative make it imperative that that which was seen as soft, interfaith and interreligious, is taken seriously. Governments take it seriously, even if they, 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 they want to manipulate. Uh, governments take it seriously. Corporations do. When I was fundraising in the old days, when I first began the center, I know people in corporations that would say, I'd love to fund what you do. There were corporations that, for example, even worked in the Middle East. But we don't, we don't deal with religion and religion and international affairs. So what is the challenge in the 21st century? The challenge in the 21st century, as far as I'm concerned, is pluralism. Political pluralism and religious pluralism. They're, but they're different, but under, with, beneath it, they're similar. That is, both required the acceptance of diversity. And the notion that diversity can mean we have differences, diversity does not necessarily mean that it is a threat, whether it's political pluralism or religious pluralism. Today, Muslims and Christians in the West and globally share common challenges and concerns. Both condemn social and economic injustice. Listen to Pope Francis, for example, excessive material, Pope Francis again, individualism, consumerism at the expense of the public good, violence and terrorism. These political, moral and social challenges affect Christians and Muslims and indeed people of all faith and no faith alike. Recognition of these common concerns and goals offers a basis for cooperation and mutual understanding, for greater unity in the midst of diversity, and contributes to a more pluralistic outlook based upon understanding and respect. Understand what I mean by understanding and respect. To be frank, when I started the, 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 uh, the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding, the one word I didn't like was understanding, and they said I couldn't change it. I thought that was a soft term. You know, we're doing religion and international affairs, Christian and Muslim understanding, does that mean that we're supposed to, what, hold hands, sing good songs together, you know, et cetera? I just thought it was a soft term. Today, you see that term being used across the board by many leaders in our societies, not just religious. The need for understanding and respect without necessarily saying that one agrees with everything that the other says. For Christians and Muslims, that mutual recognition should be easier. Both worship the God of Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. The Quran states, 
We believe what has been sent down to us, and we believe what has been sent down to you. Our God and your God is one, and to him we submit. The Quran also says, we have sent revelations to you, as we sent revelations to Noah and the prophets who came after him. We sent revelations to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob, and to their offspring, to Jesus, Job, Moses, God spoke directly. Religious pluralism today challenges us to move beyond the pitfalls of religious exclusivism. When I grew up, Catholicism was the one true faith, and the only real religion, and other people were wrong. When I wanted to be a Boy Scout, we had a Boy Scout master who was Italian Catholic. It was an issue whether or not I could join the troop. Why? It met in the basement of a Methodist church. And in America, when I grew up, if you wanted to go to a non-Catholic church, you had to get permission from your pastor. Well, why then? But why would it be a problem if it was in the basement? I suddenly realized four years ago why. I'm a slow learner. Because if it was in a neighborhood of a Methodist church, it meant you were going to have Methodist kids. And your kids, your Catholic kids, were going to be introduced to them. And would, you know, would, they, would that lead that to question the faith? Today, the challenge is to go beyond that religious exclusivism that many of us were raised with, but that, in fact, the Christian right still adapts. White evangelicals, conservative Roman Catholics, those two groups that normally would never go together often cooperate together on issues like political positions with regard to a variety of positions that our government will look into with regard to homeschooling because you don't want to send them to schools where there's diversity. It'll threaten their faith. Christians and Muslims need to recognize that each religion contains elements of truth, and that's what interfaith is about. The acceptance that all religions have elements of truth. One can judge how much, how little, but it's not as if you say, my religion has the truth, and your religion can have any truth. Then you're in a black and white dualistic worldview, which really doesn't work very well, neither in politics nor in religion. People of faith and no faith are challenged to work together to build a society based upon mutual understanding and respect, to embrace a healthy pluralism that recognizes diversity and difference, but also our shared values and interests. We are all challenged to reaffirm and protect the centrality of our principles and our values, politically as well as religiously. Equality of citizenship, pluralism, civil liberties for all. I would end by making a, a point. Don't use the word tolerance unless you redefine it. Tolerance, as we did in the past, meant I simply tolerate your existence. So you can exist in my side. doesn't mean that I necessarily would want to see you elected to government. doesn't mean that I'd want you as a neighbor. doesn't mean that I would want to hire you. We have to move beyond that to a, an inclusive understanding if we are going to use the word tolerance. It has to be an inclusive rather than an exclusive. And I, I would end with two quotes from two men that I admire. One is Cardinal Bernadine who said, former Cardinal of Chicago, we can keep our deepest convictions and still keep our civil courtesy. We can test others' arguments, but not question their motives. We can presume goodwill even when we strenuously disagree. We can relate the best of religion to the best of politics in the service of each other and the wider society, national and human, to which we are bound in faith hope, and love. And finally, Pope Francis. I, I said Pope Francis, right? No, don't I said St. Francis. Okay, let's get that down. All right. My Franciscan background's coming out here. I don't speak of Islamic violence. If I speak of Islamic violence, I must speak of Catholic violence. Not all Muslims are violent. Not all Catholics are violent. 
our respect for true followers of Islam should lead us to avoid hateful generalizations. One of the things we tend to do, we religious folk, is we compare our ideal to somebody else's reality. So we look at your religion, we see your problems. We do it politically too. I mean, we have our ideal. And I remember when I was growing up, you could never criticize the church because you would say, no, no, that's not what Holy Mother the Church teaches. You know, even though there may be a problem with the practice there. We must avoid hateful generalizations because for Islam, for because authentic Islam and the proper reading of the Quran are opposed to every form of violence. And I would say that's something to think about. You need to read that a little closer. Because if you don't, and if you, and if you are a Christian or a Jew, all you have to do is look at the Bible and realize, particularly if you look at a good deal of the Old Testament, as, as, as some scholars have said, the Old Testament is the only major religious text where God at a certain point commands genocide because of a lack of obedience. So our challenge today, and the value, I think, of, of the awards that have been given today, is an affirmation, not of, of us, the two of us, although he certainly, Father Milia, d deserves it, but, it, but it, it's, it's a challenge in terms of the world in which we live and the world in which some of us leave for the next generation. And I'm not trying to be negative about this, but as somebody who's spoken for 40 or 50 years and was always able to end a lot of my talks by talking about the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, the way forward, there are times when you look at international politics and when you hear some politicians or would-be politicians speak and religious leaders when well, one really worries about that. Thank you very much.